Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second in our pre-election series with Dr. Tebby Troy. This series is sponsored by Yeshiva University's Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs Herrenstein Center for Values and Leadership, the Zahava Moshe Strauss Center for Torah and Western Thought, and the Senator Joseph Lieberman Mitzner Center for Public Service and Advocacy. I'm Erica Brown, and I have the distinct pleasure of talking tonight with Dr. Tevi Troy, a senior scholar at the Strauss Center, a fellow of the Presidential Leadership Initiative at the Bipartisan Policy Center, and a former deputy of the HHS and senior White House aide. He's the author of five books. His most recent book just came out, and we'll talk about it, is The Power and the Money, The Epic Clashes Between Commanders-in-Chief and Titans in Industry. Tevi is also a good friend and a neighbor. Tebby, before we begin, I want to thank you publicly for your service to our country. And to note that today is 9-11. I'm currently in New York. 23 years ago today, we were devastated and bewildered on this day. And so many police officers, firefighters, and good citizens lost their lives protecting our democracy. We honor them today. Terror is still an immense anxiety for us all on this 300 and 41st day since October 7th. Tevi, tonight we're talking about transitions of power and the anxiety that they produce. Tell me why you think leadership transitions of power are important. Well, thank you for that, Erica, and thank you for those words about 9-11. I still remember that I was in the Department of Labor on that terrible, terrible day, and uh, when we realized that the second plane had hit and that this was not some accident, but actually mm -hmm. a dastardly attack on this country, they uh, basically told everyone who worked in any government building to go home. But the metros were closed, the streets were blocked, so you had a lot of people just walking the streets of Washington trying to get home, and I, I vividly remember that, that terrible mm -hmm. day, so uh, it's, it's a good time to honor the memory of the, those who fell on that day. I think the importance of transitions is actually something that we learned from 9-11 because 9-11 wasn't that long after Bush became president. Bush becomes president in January of 2001. 9-11 obviously happens in September of 2001. And Bush had a truncated transition. Remember, there was the contested election between Gore and Bush in 2000. The I, I have tried to forget that, but uh, <laughs> yes, coming back. I mean... That election was nothing compared to what we've seen in recent years, but <laughs> we'll but get there. there. There's that contested election. For 35 days, the country doesn't know who's going to be the next president. Mm. The transitions are on hold for those 35 days. Right. And Bush was behind the eight ball from the first minute. And it was it took longer to get his national security team in place. It took longer for them to get experienced and staffed up. And perhaps, perhaps we can never know if the transition had started earlier, maybe somebody would have said, hey, these guys taking flight lessons and just wanting to learn how to fly but not how to land, this could be a problem. So yeah. you never know what government could prevent if it has more time to prepare or think about it. And, yeah, uh, I yeah. I think also though it's it's important to note as we're, you know, still reeling from from October 7th. That there are unprecedented things that happen in the world, like 9/11 on this on this shore, and 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 you know we can blame people for not being prepared, but but to some degree, there's this element of how do you transition into a state that you've never been in? How, you you don't even know how to prepare. Right, and and that is one of the challenges of our democracy. One of the advantages of our democracy is we have peaceful transfers of power, and I always think the most important election. In American history wasn't the first, wasn't the second, but the third election where John Adams transfers power, I guess the fourth election, where John Adams willingly, reluctantly, but willingly transfers power to Thomas Jefferson, who defeats him in the election. He wasn't happy about it. He was a bit of a, a baby about it in terms of that he didn't go to the inauguration, but he willingly transferred power. He didn't control the military. He didn't say, I'm not leaving. And that established an important tr tradition in American history and in Western democracy. Yeah. But with that, with that massive change in direction for government, potentially every four years, you have new people coming in, many of them not experienced, many of them had not been in government before, many of them have different perspectives on how government should be run compared to how it was running mm. previously. 
and you need some way to get them integrated and prepared and up to speed on what government does and what they can do and what they can't do in their new positions. And that's what transition is all about. Yeah. And, and actually we, you know, in, in, in a conversation that we had in preparing for this, I was thinking about the actual day in the white house, right? Where all the furniture of one president gets moved. And so, you know, when we think about moving, we think about this is one of the great stressors and it takes time and you process, but all of a sudden there's this, there's this, you know, this move right away. Um, I'm thinking about the Kennedy white house. So, you know, LBJ comes in, now Jacqueline Kennedy is dealing with her children, with her family, with this assassination, and she has to move and, and she has to leave. But with so, her grief. Don't forget with that. With her grief. Right. With her grief, unresolved. And 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 there's this, you know, your your entire life gets uprooted. So I'm actually wondering if you know anything about that that day of transition for the family, not only for the president. Yeah, it's it's a big day. It's a traumatic day. Um, one of my favorite stories about this is when Grover Cleveland and his wife leave the White House uh, when they are uh, they lose to uh, Benjamin Harrison in 1892. And as they're preparing to leave the White House, Mrs. Cleveland says to the White House ushers, the staff, the permanent people who are there, administration and administration out, the people who take care of the residents, she says, watch the furniture because we're coming back. And they indeed did come back in 1896. They win that next election. And um, it's the only time you had a um, president leave, win an election, come back. It could happen again this year. Uh, we'll see. But well, not clear. Tanya Trump has said, watch the furniture. You know, where we're coming back. Uh, those are just the, you know, the small particulars. And they don't really tell the whole story of what leadership transition and leadership crisis is all about. You know, thinking a little bit, uh, Tebby, about the instability. I mean, we're talking on a presidential level, but even on a corporate level, on a nonprofit level, on a, an educational level. When, when, when the head, the director, the CEO leaves an organization and a new person comes in, it's a shift often of identity for, for a corporation. Uh, Peter Senge in The Fifth Discipline talks about you know, this, this onboarding process where whatever I did may get overturned. And we only have a few years, you know, certainly in a one-term election, a few years to really put things in place. So I, I'm sort of wondering about that instability and if you could speak to the instability that happens, not only for the presidents themselves, but for the public. Yeah, I mean, the public is in some ways rocked by these changes. Uh, you've got an administration going one way, then it's going the other way. There are certain policies that always change when a new president comes in. There's a so-called uh, Mexico City policy about uh, funding abortions internationally. Uh, that changes when a Democrat comes in or when a Republican comes in. Could you, so, could, you, could you explain that a little bit more for our listeners? There, there's this policy. It's called the Mexico City policy, and it's um, a prohibition on the U.S. paying for abortions abroad. Uh, but money is fungible, so it, it basically means the U.S. won't fund certain international organizations that provide abortions. And when the Republicans are in, they impose the prohibition. And when Democrats are come in, they remove the prohibition. And it's kind of a known thing that the Mexico City policy changes when we have a new administration put to town. So, I mean, that's just one example of the many, many ways in which a new president leads to new approaches. And it's traumatic for the American people sometimes, but it's also traumatic within the government. You've got 2 million federal employees, bureaucrats, you know, career employees, whatever you want to call them. And th those people are suddenly given a new direction. And they were told to do one thing for four years. And then for the next four years, they're told to do something else. I remember when I worked on the Bush transition in 2001, I was at the Department of Labor and we were told we had a key mission on the first day. We had to get control of the department's fax machine. Nobody thinks about fax machines anymore, right. but these are, uh, for the younger people, these are these devices where you would feed a piece of paper in and it would transmit the image to another fax machine. And then the, the you know, it was pre-email device. And the fax machine was how the Department of Labor sent rules to the Office of Management and Budget, which is kind of the central location where rules or regulations are submitted. 
And we were told we had to get control of the fax machine. And there was a guy named Marshall Deutsch who was in charge of the fax machine. So we arrived at 8 a.m. that morning. And we, my boss, who was the head of the transition, I was deputy head of the transition. My boss starts saying, where is Marshall Deutsch? I need Marshall Deutsch. Banging the table. Get me Marshall Deutsch. Well, career officials. Marshall Deutsch, if you're listening, right. this is about you. <laughs> career officials don't necessarily come in at eight o'clock in the morning like we hard charging politicals did. So we can't find Marshall Deutsch. There's no Marshall Deutsch at eight. And there's no Marshall Deutsch at 8.30. At nine o'clock, 9.30. At 10 o'clock, Marshall Deutsch comes in. Poor guy. Marshall Deutsch is just about the biggest nebbish you can imagine. <laughs> he's got the pants hiked up and he's got big glasses and you know, he's high nasal voice and the, uh, the head of the transition is all agitated. And he says, are you Marshall Deutsch? And the guy says, yes. And the, uh, the head of the transition says, I need you to stop sending everything to the federal register right now. And Marshall said, okay. And that was it. We found Marshall Deutsch, but that, that was the transition moment on the first day in uh, January of 2021 when the Bush administration took over the Department of Labor. Yeah. And and look, we experience it because both of us live in a suburb of Washington. Many people work for the government, as did you. My my husband is a is a government employee. And there's a lot of talk right now, anxiety around what could change in you know in uh, in if there's a if there's a change in in party and this change in president so there's you know there will be a change what that change is when you when you're uncertain about it uh particularly for people who actually work for the administration and all of a sudden you have a job and then in January you don't have a job uh what does that mean you know what are the implications for one's family well, let me tell you having gone through it it's traumatic yeah, <laughs> yeah. Can, can you can you just give us a sentence on it because I think not everyone appreciates what this what this means yeah. Well, first of all, let me just say your husband is indeed a government employee, but he's also an acclaimed author. So <laughs> we have to point that out. Uh, Thank you. Jeremy Brown, everybody should buy his great books. <laughs> um, in terms of the transition, what it means for people, there are about 4,000 political appointees that come in in every administration. Mm -hmm. Two million people work in the federal government, mostly career employees, but 4,000 people come in with the president. And most of them are what is known as Schedule C. They serve at the pleasure of the president. They can be hired and fired on a whim. Some of them are PASs, which are presidential appointed, confirmed by the Senate, and they have to go through Senate confirmation, about 700 of the 4,000. But on January 20th of a new presidential term, those people are pretty much out of a job. There are rare exceptions where the president will say, we need this ambassador to this country to stay for the transition, or or we think you're doing a good job, you're in a state. But the vast, vast majority of those 4,000 people are asked to leave. And sometimes it happens when there's a bad economy, like uh, when uh, Trump left office. Sometimes it happens when all the levers of power switch to a new party. In 2008, Obama wins. He also wins the House and the Senate. So you had 4,000 people leaving the Bush administration, all saying, where am I going to go to work? Not only am I kicked out of the administration, but Republicans have lost seats in the House and Senate. And nobody wants to hire on K Street somebody who worked in a Republican administration. They only want to hire Democrats right now because Democrats right. control the levers of power. And obviously it works the other way as well. So it is a, it is a challenging time. It also has an impact on the local businesses. Uh, we always know that uh, when Republicans come in, they favor certain bars and restaurants. And when Democrats come in, they favor their own bars and restaurants. They favor their own neighborhoods. So there are implications throughout the ecosystem that is Washington for these transitions. Yeah. And I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned that because it gives people really a sense of of, of the ripple effect of, of a presidential transition. Um, I actually, I want to, I want to go back in time. Um, I want to go back in time because one of the things that's, that I think uh, the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, is particularly sensitive to is describing transitions, transitions within a family, transitions within a polity. Um, I, I, I just want to talk about one, and if you don't mind, I'd actually like to to cite cite word and verse. Um, I want to I want to take us to the book of Numbers, uh, Bamidbar uh, twenty seven, and I just want to read fifteen to twenty, and I want I, I'd like your sort of take on this, Tevi. 
So Moses speaks to God. He knows that he is not crossing into the promised land. And he says, let the Lord, source of the breath of all flesh, appoint someone over the community who will go out before them and come in before them and who will take them out and bring them in so that God's community may not be like a sheep that have no shepherd. And God answers Moses and says, single out Joshua, son of Nun, an inspired man, lay your hands upon him, have him stand before Eliezer the priest and before the whole community and commission him in their sight, invest him with some of your authority so that the whole Israelite community may obey. Moses is worried because he has invested his entire life, 40 years, taking people through the Exodus process and out of slavery, bringing them the law at Sinai, trekking through the desert, and, and dealing with all the conflicts and complaints and the breakdown of leadership, and now he's going to die. And he knows that if he does not think about the future, that that all that he's built will be gone. So I'm just interested in how you, given your political career and given your vast knowledge of presidential history, read these verses. Yeah, there's so much interesting stuff there. First of all, Moshe is frustrated and saddened that he can't enter the promised land. This is what he wants most. But he also, he loves the people and he's devoted to the people. And there's a, there's another pasuk where he asks Hashem to make sure he picks out a man of discernment and wisdom. So he wants the right leader for Israel. He hopes Joshua is the right person. Joshua is his kind of right-hand guy. Uh, but there's a mixture there of sadness in that he's not going to get to be the guy, but also hope for the future that Hashem has picked the right person and this person will be able to lead Israel to the next stage. Yeah, and I, I actually, I, I think about this often when um, I'm reviewing in Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, he talks about uh, that the level five leader is someone, you know, with uh, with real humility and also real drive, which, which is characteristic of the way that Moses is described. And and he he makes sure it because because the entity is so important, the company is so important, what he's built is so important, or he she's built is so important. Um, the 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 create the creation of a, of a smooth succession pipeline is critical, and you don't feel that at all in Washingtonian politics, right? What you feel is there's almost a I'm going to erase everything that you did, even if there were worthwhile things that you did. I've got to put my own stamp and hallmark on them. Um, so I, I'm, I'm actually, let's go, let's go to the debate. I imagine you watched it last night. Well, you know, I, I want to make another point before yeah, you please, get to the debate please. about, um, biblical transitions, because they're not all done with the care of Moshe. Correct. And I remember, and I've got to give a shout out to, um, my 10th grade Navi teacher, uh, Betty Ehrenberg. I don't know if she was on the call, but, uh, she was a wonderful Navi teacher later went into Jewish politics at the world Jewish Congress. Uh, and the most frequent phrase you see the most frequent phrase in um in malachim is vayakam melech hadash asher lo yadad hashem and right. so a new can you king, just translate for our going to, oh, a okay. new king arises who did not know the ways of the lord so you constantly have these switches and you have a god-fearing king and then comes this melech hadash this new king who comes in in the previous king's place and doesn't go with the ways of the lord and you know, the, uh, uh, there's usually punishments that follow because they, they, they didn't follow what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah, I, I actually, um, as long as we're talking about biblical favorites, I, I mean, I think a lot about Elisha, the elder, uh, uh, Elijah and Elisha, Elijah, the elder statesman, the elder prophet, and then Elijah, uh, then Elisha, his novitiate, his novice. And there's this moment when Elijah is taken up in a whirlwind and and his mantle falls on the ground and Alicia picks it up. And there's this sense, how am I going to do, how, what, what kind of powers are, have been invested in me? And he, he actually asks Elijah before Elijah is taken in the whirlwind, I can only do what you do if you can give me uh, you know, twice your twice your wisdom. Um, it's, a, it's a very beautiful and tender scene. And, and one of the things that's very striking to me is that after he dies, there are a group of prophets who said, this is the biggest, this is the biggest job in town, right? Was, they're all candidates for this position and they all want this position. And here, you know, Alicia was a simple farmer by background. He did not go to the Ivy League School of Prophecy. And uh they bow down to him as the new person in town, but then they say, let's look for Elijah. 
and they spend three days looking for him. And Alicia says, you're not going to find him. And that's actually an interesting question in transitions. What happens when the next person does not let go, right? There's a new rabbi, but the old rabbi continues in the pulpit, right? And he's there every week. So how, how does this affect things? I don't know if you have any you know, wisdom sure. on that. No, and we see this in the business world. I mean, there was an unbelievable story in the New York Times business section this weekend about Bob Iger and Bob Chapek at Disney. And Iger was the longstanding CEO of Disney. He's very popular, but he chose to leave after a certain amount of time. He was ready to retire. But he's constantly undermining his successor, Chapek. And mm -hmm. Chapek is frustrated by Iger's inability, unwillingness to leave the scene. And there are all kinds of problems that Disney has in, in terms of COVID and in terms of their fight with Governor DeSantis. And Iger is basically saying, look, this is Chapek's fault. Chapek's messing this up. Sometimes he's fanning the flames in the media. And eventually what happens is Chapek falters and Iger comes back in. Here's a guy who voluntarily retired and he undermines his successor so badly that he has to come back in and take over the job. Yeah, and 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 you know what that what that does um, to the company, right? What that does to your employees, um, it, it it makes it it makes it so hard to take over a leadership role. Um, can we go to the debate now? Is now just one more thing. I just got to do sure. one more thing. We <laughs> talked about this before in our prep, which is yeah. sometimes there's failed transitions also in the biblical yeah. sense. And um, I always love the story in, um, I think it's in 2 Samuel Shmuel Bet, about uh, Adonijah or Adonai, Adoniyahu, who is David's son, but not from Bathsheba. And he thinks as David falters and gets sick, that he's going to take over and he fattens bulls and he does sacrifices. And uh, and Solomon, who's been told, and, he, and his mother, Bathsheba, has been told that he's going to take over, they're wondering what's going to happen to them. Because if Adonijah takes over, that's it. I mean, they're going to be beheaded because that's what you do. You kill the other brothers from other mothers or not, not even sometimes from other mothers. You kill them all. And they have to go with Nathan the prophet to David, who's really, really on his last legs. And he's got this comfort woman with him and um, Abishag the Shunammite. And they basically have to somehow get David to reassert his authority sufficiently that Adonijah is put in his place, told he's not going to take over and that Solomon will take over. And of course, doesn't end well for Adonijah because he is eventually killed, just like Solomon would have been killed if it had gone the other way. Yeah, and 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 you see these these rock the house. Um, I actually, I, I take a lot of comfort in how honest these stories actually are about power and the corrupting influence of power. Um, you know, we're not, we're, we're, we're actually alerted to a lot of the dangers of transition because leadership is so central to the Hebrew Bible. It's like, if you, if you build something magnificent and you want it to last for millennia, you have to think all the time about the succession pipeline before Abraham dies. It's not enough to have Ishmael and Isaac. He has to find a wife for Isaac. Isaac has to have a child. You have to sort of know where, you know, where is this going? So, in terms of rocky transitions, now we can talk about the debate? Yes, now we can talk about the debate. Now we can talk about the debate. So I I, I focused in last night on many aspects of it. Uh, we're not political pundits here, and that's not what we're trying to do. But I I, I, I was really intrigued about, um, about President Trump's remarks last night. Um, and um, the, 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 NBC, the ABC News moderator, David Muir, asked him about uh, about whether he was prepared for a peaceful transition of power. And he said, um, you know, last week, you, President Trump, said that you lost by a whisker, which was an acknowledgement that he actually lost and that they, there and that there was a recognized and acknowledged transfer of power. And he said, and I, I, I did this verbatim, I said that. And, um, and David Muir said, are you now acknowledging that you lost in 2020? And he said, no, I, I don't acknowledge that at all. That was said sarcastically. And then asked about the peaceful transfer of power. President Trump did not say that he regrets anything about his actions on January 6, 2021. He claimed last night that he had nothing to do with what happened that day, which culminated in an attack on the U.S. Capitol. I imagine that our listeners are concerned and have every right to be concerned that if President Trump does not win, what will be the state? 
of our state, of our states. Yeah, well, I, I have every confidence that President Trump loses, we will have a peaceful transition of power. He will be immature about it like he was in the past, but uh, this time he won't have the levers of power even. So okay. I'm sure there will be a peaceful transition of power if he loses. Uh, unfortunately- Now I can sleep tonight, thank yeah. you. But I also think that if he loses, what's gonna stop him from running again in 2028? Because everyone thought he had no chance in 2024 because of what happened in January 6th and the way he left uh, office and he cakewalked to the Republican nomination. So right. there's every possibility that even at age, I guess he'll be born 46, so he'll be you know, 82. Uh, even at that age, he will probably run again. And then we'll have to go through all this again. Right. Well, so that maybe you yeah, sleep that's... a little better on one front, but less well on the other. <laughs> well, I, I, I think this is a general question. I and mean, we saw probably a I think it was an unprecedented transition of power in the Democratic Party post debate. These these debates have really shown us a lot. I know last week you you spoke about uh, the debate about debates, um, and next next week you'll be speaking with um, and we'll we'll mention it later. Drop it in the chat, um, Rabbi Dr. Dove Lerner about is there a religious way to vote? But for tonight, in thinking about this transition of power. You had you had Joe Biden. He was committed. President Biden was committed to running. And then post debate, people really questioned his capabilities. And and then you had this. I mean, I think it was I, I can't remember how many days it, it was before the election, but I think it was the it was the it was a nominee appointed closest to the actual election. Is that right? It was the latest person the latest. to yeah. say they're not going to run again in presidential yeah. history. Right, yeah. So LBJ says he's not going to run again in March 31st, 1968. Mm. That's late, but not as late as this but thing, not which as, was in, in basically in July. Right. Not as not as late as this. Huh. And that that also really shook the Democratic Party, the, the attempt to exculpate his performance at the debate. And then the recognition a few weeks later, I'd written about it in the Atlantic and and I, I think it was just the topic of what will, what, you know, will the Democratic Party survive? And now all of a sudden there's this burst of explosive energy. You want to talk about that transition and how unusual that was? Yeah, I've, I've been telling this joke in uh, my lectures and classes that if I should die, I would want to be reincarnated as a major party nominee who doesn't have to go through the nomination process. <laughs> right. It's the greatest thing ever. You don't have to raise money. You don't have to trudge through the snows of New Hampshire. You don't have to talk to pesky reporters. You just you just <laughs> you show don't up. Have to eat you don't eat any corn dogs at right. um, state fairs. Right. And you and you don't have to go through the debates with 10 people on stage yelling at you. Uh, you basically show up and you have a 50 50 shot at becoming the next president. It's a uh, it's the best odds you're going to get. So um, it, it was an odd process. And uh, I, th I thought Trump actually made some points last night in the debate when I th overall I thought it was a very poor performance by him, but he made some points when he said, Biden got 14 million votes. You didn't get any votes. What kind of democratic process is this? And, and I do question the process by which it happened. Uh, at the same time, it was clear that Biden was not viable anymore and couldn't run again and, and they had to do something different. I thought it was going to be a more open process where they would uh, allow other candidates to get in. But uh, the Democrats rightly feared that that would be kind of messy and you might have 10 people vying for it at the convention. And so not a lot wanted, of time. Right. right. And they just wanted to sew it up and say one person is anointed. And, um, you know, I think some of the ambitious Democrats who have their eye on 2028 thought, oh, well, she hasn't performed well as vice president. She probably won't win. And this will set me up to run in 2028. But she surprised everybody in that she has performed beyond expectations as candidate, much better than she's been as vice president, much better than she was as presidential nomination candidate in 2020. And here we have, uh, I think now the odds are higher than 50-50 that uh, she is the winner. I mean, it's very close, but she clearly uh, had the edge in the debate last night. She has the momentum, she has the money, so we'll, we'll see what happens. I'm not willing to call the race yet, but uh, but it was, it was a good performance by her and, uh, and she doesn't really, she did the did the debate, she did the interview. She doesn't really have to face a situation where she has to speak extemporaneously again. And that in the past has been her weakness. 
So yeah, but last night it seemed to be it seemed to be a strength. Um, uh, you know, putting uh, putting him on the defensive, um, and sort of all these all these trigger points. Um, actually, was speaking about this with um, the dean of our Sci Sims Business School, Noam Wasserman. Um, he wrote a book, The Founder's Dilemma, uh, about business and what happens when you know when a founder out lives the mission of the organization and what happens and we were talking about the fact that as a result people don't know who she is they don't really know a lot about her policies and she didn't get buy-in and then the question is now what do you have to do to create the buy-in for a successful transition um so you know there's there's, there's all kinds of transitional anxiety right there um i want to now just uh, turn to your latest book um, one of my favorites is The Fight House. Um, Tebby's books are always entertaining and full of fun facts. Um, tell us a little bit about what, why you wrote that book and how transitions appear in that book. So my current book is The Power and the Money, Epic Clashes Between Commanders-in-Chief and Titans of Industry. And it's a 150-year look at presidents and their relationship with CEOs of major companies and these are all iconic CEOs, well-known CEOs who interacted with more than one president in their lifetimes. So Jack Welch, for example, who was the longtime head of GE, interacted with 10 presidents over the course of his lifetime. And the point I'm trying to make is that presidents are term limited. They have one or two terms, with the exception right. of Franklin Roosevelt, who uh, was elected four times. But they have a limited time in office, whereas the CEOs can sometimes serve for decades and in doing so, they meet multiple presidents, they take different approaches to how they deal with different presidents, and you can compare and contrast their approaches by looking at it. So it was kind of a business case book in that sense, that you can look at these different things and, and compare the different ways they do it. But it was also trying to speak to our current moment where CEOs seem more powerful than ever before. The yeah. tech companies have a huge impact on our lives. The CEOs in our disaggregated culture are some of the best known people. You don't really necessarily know that sitcom star on CBS anymore because there's no one TV show that everybody watches. But everybody knows who Elon Musk is. Everybody knows who Mark Zuckerberg is. I mean, these guys have Q ratings that are incredibly high. Q rating is a recognizability factor. So these people are very powerful, very well known. And they're also somewhat resented. Right now you have a situation where both Democrats and Republicans seem to dislike corporations and their leaders. And so I thought it was an appropriate time to take my presidents and blank method, where I look at presidents and something relevant in the culture to apply that lens to CEOs. Yeah, and um, did you discover anything that makes transitions a little bit smoother? Yeah, so I, I do talk about a couple of transitions in the book. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned Jack Welch. I mean, Jack Welch, uh, to take over at GE, I mean, they have a really brutal process where they put potential successors against each other, and they're competing within the company for a couple of years before they decide who the next person is. And then once you're there, you kind of assert your dominance, and the, the people who don't make it leave. So that, that's a, a kind of brutal transition. Yeah, um, I can. I, can I just put a pin yeah. on that for a second? Uh, because you know, I, I've actually run a bunch of searches myself within the Jewish nonprofit space, and very often, if there's an internal candidate who is not who is not chosen as successor within a search um, within a search framework, that person says, "I I don't feel valued," even though that person may be highly valued in position and in the right place in an organization. But the sense, if I can't get promoted. That's a referendum on my leadership. I'll go elsewhere. And that that also causes a loss within the organization. So again, in thinking about how do you do this in a more stable way, advice or recommendation? Yeah, I mean, well, look, we have a friend, you and I both have a friend in this community where that happened in, in the school. I don't want to get into details, right. but uh, it felt like the person was not valued because they were not considered for the top job and then they went elsewhere. And, and I think it was a loss for the school. So yeah, that, that does happen. And it's really hard if you are going to have a transition where somebody who thinks they could get the job and doesn't get it, that person is going to either look elsewhere or be less effective. And so I think what you have to do is be very honest and upfront with that person in advance 
so that they know, you know, this job isn't for you, but we value you. We'll give you a promotion. We'll give you a salary bump. We'll give you make very clear responsibilities. We'll make sure you have a say in the successor, but you can't just ignore them and say, Hey, someone else is coming in. Right. So let's, let's now bump that up because we're, this is a pre-election conversation on a presidential level. Do you know of any presidential transition where there's been a change of party, but the policies of a previous president have continued because they were, let's say, worthy or they were, um, they became more entrenched in society. And, and, and that president, despite being from a different party, kept the policies going. Oh, yeah, of course. And I think the most obvious example is the Cold War. We were involved in this struggle against Soviet Russia and the communist system. And when Dwight D. Eisenhower takes over from Harry Truman, he doesn't give up on uh, the Cold War. And when John F. Kennedy takes over from Eisenhower, he doesn't give up on it either. And it's uh, the policies remain remarkably consistent for a 40 year period. And that's one of the reasons why the U.S. was able to be successful in that war. Now, you look at our current situation where it seems like there's an almost complete shift in foreign policy from one administration to the other. And it makes it very hard to get any kind of rhythm, continuity, coherence to our policy. And in fact, you look at the Middle East where the Obama administration has this, uh, let's deal with Iran more and loosen up money for them. And the Trump administration says, let's take away money from them. And then the Biden administration le says, let's give them more money again. And it's not working, right? right? You, you got to stick to one policy. Uh, so my, my friend uh, Jonah Goldberg always talks about our immigration policy. And when he's asked about his preferred immigration policy, he says, my preferred immigration policy for the U.S. is that we have one. Yeah. Because well the, said. Right, the incoherence is a, a weakness. Yeah. And you're always, you're taking one step forward, two steps backward, and then there's just no real movement forward. Um, I mean, I see this on on a, a smaller leadership level uh, within organizations where someone comes in, lots of aspirations, lots of ambition, making changes. And we know that in many leadership positions now, people stay for two to four years. What can you get done in two years? You're just learning the politics, the policies of an organization, and then you're leaving the organization. Um, and, and, and you know, it's an interesting question of who holds the balance of power when, when people are dissatisfied. Uh, I, I often talk about the importance of being a good follower. Now everybody knows everything and talk, and, and it's very hard to be successful when you're constantly under the public eye, the role of social media. So let's just let's just pause on social media for a moment. How do you think social media, does it help transitions? Does it get in the way? Does it thwart transitional success? I think social media and just our overall overly transparent society, I guess, is something that can be damaging to governing. And I think it's it's necessary. I think we we you know, we, we want to know more information. But there are instances where sometimes we have too much information. So the leaked meeting information after every meeting on Twitter, and so this especially happens in the Israeli cabinet, uh, is a real problem. And then you think about another one. Let's let's talk about C-SPAN. I'm a huge fan of C-SPAN. I think it's a, a great network. But the fact that they televise every congressional hearing means that there's no private space for members of opposite parties to work out bipartisan deals behind closed doors. And so the fact that it's televised in their home districts encourages them to take maximalist positions so they don't seem like they're caving to the other side. And so while I agree that C-SPAN is a good thing and uh, happy to have them televise all kinds of great stuff, maybe there should be some kind of private space where members can work stuff out without necessarily being in front of the fleet lights. Yeah, that's such a that's such an interesting point. I haven't, I haven't thought about that. Um, this summer, I read Life After Power by Jared Cohen, just came out in 2024. If I'm not mistaken, seven portraits of presidents post-presidency from the, you know, Jimmy Carter, who lives a long time and has a whole uh, sort of, other life, uh, George W. Bush, who who starts painting, right? In other words, he he really leaves the presidency. Jimmy Carter still opines about it and 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 argues with current presidents, much like the the Disney conversation we we're having before. 
Um, I, I found it fascinating and it, and it made me think of a theory. Let me know what you think about this. We don't really have an official role for post presidents. And I think sometimes some of what we're seeing now in the age comments, right? It, should there be a term, you know, should there be their term limits? Should there be age limits for presidents? Is if people knew they had some kind, they, they transitioned out of the White House into some kind of noble, dignified position, maybe it's a quasi authority, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, then they'd know where they were going. But I think it must be very, very hard if you've given your life to public service to then say, okay, I was the president yesterday, and today what am I? People's identities are deeply, deeply tied into this. And I and I wonder again if we had a more successful successful pipeline out of the presidency, would would older politicians or 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 or, or congress members for that matter, would older po politicians feel better about leaving and leave? Yeah, there's two great stories on this. One is George W. Bush. When he leaves office, he wakes up the next morning at, uh, in Texas in his house in Dallas, and he says to Laura, who's making the coffee? And she says, you are. <laughs> the other one is about the longstanding senator who loses election after many, many years. And the next morning after the uh, Senate takes over, he loses, he no longer has the position. He gets in the back seat of a car and barks out where he wants to go, not recognizing that there's no one in the front seat who's going to drive him and he has to drive himself. <laughs> That's fantastic. That, well, tell us, say more, say more about this, not from an anecdotal perspective, but but what what would it what would it look like? I, I, I by the way, I've, I've spoken to a lot of people in the nonprofit sector post their 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 big job. And they feel I have so much wisdom and I have so much experience. And the minute I left, no one is calling me. I, I actually know someone who wrote a poem about it, wrote a long poem about, you know, now I'm the I'm I'm, I'm no longer wanted. And that and that feeling after giving so much time, uh, especially volunteer time, can be very, um, very diminishing. Yeah. And it's not just presidents. I mean, we talked earlier about the 4000 people who leave government every four years and one day they have power and the next day they don't. And it's, uh, you know, it can be challenging. Uh, I think that this is kind of the nature of our system. We have democratic elections so that people can leave and new people can come in with new ideas. And uh, George Washington had the famous Cincinnatus model, which is uh, Cincinnatus was the uh, Roman statesman who, uh, when he was called, he put down his plow and he uh, went to battle on behalf of Rome. And then when the war was over, he went and he picked up his plow again. Uh, it also reminds me of uh, George Washington when uh, he's heading the Continental Army and they are victorious and he steps down from leadership. And George III hears that uh, this was Washington's plan. And he says, if he shall do that, he shall be the greatest man in the world. Because mm -hmm. it would never, never, ever occur to George III to leave power for any reason why you know, he's the king he's right. divinely chosen why would he ever leave power good to be but, the king yeah as my but in the american system we move on and uh and and the jared cohen book which i think is a very interesting book talks about how these people it's a form of trauma i guess it's a form of separation anxiety these people have to find ways to deal with it and i think george w bush with painting found a better way to deal with it than let's say jimmy carter yeah, but but it, I you know just to push my to push my solution, what would it look like to actually formalize a position? I I do know organizations that do this better that have uh you know that that engage their post presidents and their former presidents get together on an annual basis. They're often consulted and you know there's there's a role for them so that they don't have to feel you've been put out to pasture when you could be mentoring, you could be growing, you could be leading. Um, I was fascinated by the 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 George W. Bush departure, where he just he said, "I've done this, and now I'm uh, now I'm doing something else." It wasn't that his entire value, uh, self worth, was connected to the position. And and again, to go to the Trump presidency or the or the Biden presidency, is there is there a point where you think we should put in an age limit to to presidents? precisely to aid people 
in creating a transitional on-ramp. You know, you yeah. know that it's, it, you know, you can't do this past, I'm, I'm just giving a number, 75. Then if you're 72, you're putting, you're putting a mechanism in place for the next leadership. I'm astonished at how few people there are in the pipeline in, in both the Democratic and Republican parties. Why, why was it so difficult? Why is it so difficult to get a new candidate? Yeah, I, I do think that it, there is some wisdom to picking an age limit, maybe 80, uh, some age beyond which you cannot serve. Uh, but that's just not going to happen right now while uh, you have people at that age still on the stage. Uh, but if we were to do it, it would have to be, you put it as some undetermined date in the future. So as of 2035, no one over the age of 80 shall serve as president, something like that. So it doesn't affect anybody who's realistically in the arena right now. In terms of your president emeritus idea, I think it's hard to do. I just, I really yeah. do because so many times, let's say uh, Jimmy Carter loses resoundingly to uh, Ronald Reagan in 1980. Did anybody really want Jimmy Carter to have some role in government? And the, the American people rejected him. Or, uh, you know, I don't mean to make it a Democrat thing, or, you know, um, George H.W. Bush in 92, rejected by the people. And I don't think the people would have wanted that George H.W. Bush uh, suddenly, you know, have some right. other yeah. President of America. Christmas. Although I do have a great George H.W. Bush story. Let's go. That, so this is after Bush has lost his election. He's in retirement. And uh, the CIA reaches out to Bush and tells him that they fear that Prince Bandar, who is a senior Saudi official, Saudi ambassador to Washington for many years, that he's dead because there's a supposedly a Syrian hit on him and they can't reach him. So George H.W. Bush doesn't just take the information. He tracks down Bandar and he calls him on his cell phone and Bandar says, yeah, I, I kind of went dark because I knew there was a Syrian hit squad after me. So I've been in hiding, but I'm fine. And so George H.W. Bush tells the CIA man that Bandar is in fact alive and he was just hiding from the Syrian hit squad. And the CIA man shakes his head in wonder and says, we've got to get that man back on the payroll. Because <laughs> the entire CIA couldn't figure out if Bandar was alive, right. but George H.W. Bush knew how to do it. Pick up the phone. Yeah. Um, so we talked about late transitions. Is there a time when it's too early to make transitions or too late to make transitions in your, as you as you look back on, on a number of presidencies? Absolutely. In fact, I wrote an article for National Affairs a number of years back called Measuring the Drapes. And there's this kind of syndrome where a presidential candidate is too confident they are seen as measuring the drapes uh, before they're actually winning okay. the election. And this actually happened with Hillary Clinton in 2016 because she had selected her position for every cabinet official and every type white top White House staff. They had every job picked in advance. And in fact, Axios printed the entire list sometime after the election. And the fact is she should have been focused on winning Wisconsin, Michigan, and right. um, and Pennsylvania, which were very close states that Democrats had won throughout the 20th, 21st century and were winnable for her, but she didn't pay enough attention to them. So measuring the drapes is a real problem. And uh, if you focus on the transition stuff too early and not on the election, it could be a problem. Yeah, I love that expression. Um, it, it sort of says so much with so few words. And at the same time, there's such a scramble in the transition to, you know, you want to you want to appoint a can uh, a cabinet right away. You, you've got to get to work. There's so much to do. Um, I have a great story from um, from the book, The Prime Ministers, about a number of Israel's prime ministers written by uh, uh, one of the famous speechwriters. And he he talks about Levi Eshkol going to work the first day as prime minister. And he asks a security guard or a janitor, what should I do? Right, <laughs> you're you're in this office and you're thinking, wow, I don't, you know, I, I got here, now I'm here. I've worked so hard to get here, and now what? And I, I I think a little bit about, you know, we tend to think, oh, there's inauguration balls, and it's, you know, it's sort of the 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 equivalent of a coronation in our country that we that we do, you know, uh, you know, every four years, and then there's this sense, when do you get to work? I mean, there's so much work to do. Do you want to speak yeah. to? That? I mean, there's a famous and the front lines of it. 
Yeah. Yeah. There's a famous movie, The Candidate, 1972, uh, with mm. Robert Redford, who is this kind of propped up candidate. And when he wins the election, uh, he calls his advisor into a room. It's actually worth watching the, the scene, just that scene on, on YouTube. And he calls his advisor into a room. Everybody's clamoring. They want to talk to him. The press is all over the place. And he calls his advisor into, into a private room. He closes the door. And the guy's like, what, what? We've got a lot to do. And the, he says, what do we do now? Right? Right. The, uh, he just didn't know what to do. So it's, uh, yeah, it, it's it's a hard moment, both for the outgoing and the incoming teams. Yeah, it's a, it's a really steep learning curve. Um, I remember reading the leadership book, uh, the first 90 days, right? So how do you establish yourself within the first 90 days? I'm not sure that we give people 90 days because of social media, because of this issue of transparency. We don't really give people time to get their sea legs in position. Um, we do have a we do have a comment in the chat. Can Tebby speak to the fact that the president no longer seems to be running the country, but there's an unnamed team running the country. So the election, especially on the Democratic side, feels like it's unclear who you're actually electing. Are you electing a person, I mean, of course, you're electing a, a president, but you're also electing the president's team. So can you speak to that as a transition? Yeah, it's absolutely the case that there is a team that comes with the president. I think uh, with Biden's uh, aged condition, I think a lot of people look at this and say that Biden may not really be running the country and that uh, he's got a coterie of aides. Um, but, you know, those aides have been around Biden for decades. I mean, nobody who voted for Biden was surprised to see Anthony Blinken and Ron Klain and right. um, and um, Jake Sullivan. I mean, you know, these are people who everyone expected to go in. Uh, I recognize there's 4,000 total people that come into a government and some of whom, most of whom you never hear of and never will hear right. of. But the general approach of a president and their team, I think are fairly well known going in. And, and if a president ever kind of goes against what they ran for, people remind them on it. So uh, Bill Clinton in 92 runs as a different kind of Democrat, a more moderate Democrat. And then he comes out with a whole bunch of liberal policies in his early days and the American people rebel against it. And he got uh, beaten pretty bad in the 94 election. Similarly, George H.W. Bush runs on his pledge never to raise taxes. And he does raise taxes shortly into his uh, into his first term, his only term. And the American people punish him and he loses his election. So I think you really have to be consistent in what you run as you want to be that person when you're in office. We've talked about a lot of failed transitions, trouble transitions, uh, problematic transitions. Can you give us an example of a really effective transition, just to move to something maybe a little bit more hopeful? Yeah, well, one of the first transitions ever was John F. Kennedy in 1960, and he brings these famous academics in, including Richard Neustadt, who was one of the best-known theorists on the presidency. And Neustadt writes these amazing memos you can get at the Kennedy Library about how president should think about power, about influence, and what, what he should be doing. So I think that was a good transition. Um, Reagan was known to have had a pretty good transition. He kind of knew what he wanted. He had an effective personnel team. Uh, the transition from Obama to Bush was particularly cooperative because uh, Bush had seen uh, other less cooperative transitions, and he wanted to make sure that his staff was very accommodating to the incoming Obama team. So yeah, I, I think there are positive transitions. Uh, I don't know with Trump in the picture if that is possible because um, uh, Trump felt uh, badly treated by the Obama people in 2016 and he returned the favor to the Biden people in 2020. So, uh, you know, that, that wasn't great, but presumably if Harris wins, there would be a relatively smooth transition between uh, Harris and Biden, although it's not always the case when uh, George H.W. Bush wins uh, effectively the third term for Reagan. Reagan wins two terms and Bush as vice president runs and wins. And a lot of the Reagan people thought they were going to get to stay because Bush had been the vice president of Reagan. And it did not work out that way. And one of the Bush transition officials famously told the Washington Post, our people don't have ideologies, they have mortgages which is a way of saying we don't want those Reaganites with their consistent conservative ideology. We are taking a different or pragmatic approach. Yeah. So let's just quickly, um, first lady transitions. Um, I, if I recall, there was some tussle when um, between Melania and um, 
and Michelle Obama, Melania Trump and Michelle Obama about a gift that was given uh, on on that day of transition. Any any word on that? How to do that more graciously? I mean, there, there's no policy changes between the first ladies, right, or or first man, right? If uh, Harris wins and Emhoff comes in, uh, I think that's more just about being graceful and gracious. And uh, you know, most usually you don't hear about bad blood between the first ladies. Uh, and if there is, it's usually because somebody's got uh, their own internal issues. All right, fair. Uh, we'll see. We'll see how that. We'll see how that works. Um, I just, but before we before we end this fantastic conversation, I want to mention that on September sixteenth at seven p.m. at YU in the Weisberg Commons, we're going to be hosting Professor Shai Davidai and New Dean Rebecca Sipis, Dean of Yeshiva College and Stern College, for a conversation values and conflict, fight or flight. Sorry about that. I thought that was off. Fight or flight, cultivating courage on campus. Um, so please uh, join us for an in-person event next week on uh, next week on September 18th. Tevi will appear again with Rabbi uh, Dr. Dove Lerner from the Strauss Center to talk about is there a religious way to vote? Um, I do want to end with one sort of I think there's a sort of biblical slogan in transitions, and the slogan is Chazak um, When Joshua takes Moses's position, in the first chapter of Joshua, we have this repeated phrase, Chazak v'amatz, said by the people, um, said by God to Joshua, sort of everybody wants him to succeed. Those are super, super difficult shoes to fill, and 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 he needs the encouragement of he needs the encouragement of everyone so um i thank you for thinking about this topic with us and and really wish a chazak vamats to whoever becomes a president uh to be strong and of good courage and for all of us to be strong and could of good courage for these um for these days ahead thank you so much dr tevi troy amen thank you erica for a terrific conversation and thanks to everybody for helping to put this together including especially eliza and uh, i look forward to seeing everyone next week yeah thank you so much take care have a good night <laughs>